I almost feel like we could just do a few episodes, and then when the peoples have calmed down a little bit and convinced themselves they're not going to do another entire podcast about a Final Fantasy game, we just, bam, hit them with World of Final Fantasy for two hours. One comment, and considering how few comments we get, this is proportionally a lot of opinion, said that they quite enjoyed our in-depth spoiler cast. So I think that's something we'll have to do again sometime for perhaps a different topic. Or just another Final Fantasy game. Because there's really no other topic that I feel that I'm an authority to speak on for more than an hour at a time. I don't know. Could you talk for more than an hour at a time about time travel? Because you sure did go on a rant the other night. Oh, I sure could. In <laughs> fact... <laughs> this website, it's like, okay, imagine a person who thinks time travel is possible. Or it might be possible, like in theory. And also imagine this person has no sense of humor or artistry and just looks at every single time travel movie as nothing other than a representation of what time travel might look like in reality. And then imagine this person has written an extraordinarily in-depth review of every movie that is even tangentially related to the subject of time travel. Every once in a while, you'll find someone who is on a very specific subject and then goes and well, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he does this. And I actually think it's funny because I feel like he's doing it tongue in cheek. He writes like scientific reviews on Twitter mm -hmm. about movies, or at least he used to. He stopped because people were like pissed off about it. Um, but then I also I listened to one movie podcast that's actually really good. It's called Film Sack. At least one of the guys on there knows guns pretty well. So whenever a movie prominently features a gun he will, like, kind of do a Kojima gun porn segment for about, you know, 30, 30, 90 seconds, you know, just be like, oh, yeah, and the guns in this movie, like, I mean, that was a Walter P.K. whatever. Listening to that podcast is where I now listen for gun sounds because movies from the 80s have a very distinctive, like, weird laser beamy gun sound <laughs> that you don't hear anywhere else. And that's why now when I go back and watch um, Home Alone, you know, Home Alone has that, like, fake mobster segment? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people didn't know that was a fake movie for the longest time. Like before the internet, people were like, "Oh man, I wouldn't know what this old timey movie is." Wait, and wait, you, found... you said, like the movie that Kevin's watching on screen that he plays, like "You Dirty Mugs" yeah. or whatever. Like that's not a real movie. You didn't know that. So I didn't you, know okay, that. So <laughs> that movie was created for Home Alone. And if you go and watch it now, now that I've pulled back the curtain, you'll hear that 80s gun sound, which is not a sound you would have heard in a 1940s, 50s black and white movie at all. I feel lied to, man. Oh my god, I'm I, so glad I got to bring this knowledge to you. I feel manipulated and used. Was it real cheese on the pizza that he ordered, at least? I kind of doubt it. Damn it. It's probably plastic. Yeah, Hollywood magic, man. It's great. Here, I'm going to send you a link over Discord. Okay. I mean, you're going to bookmark the page and you can peruse it at your leisure, but like, just look at how much content is in this sidebar. How many movies he's analyzed. Oh, I love this. Yeah. I, I actually kind of unironically love this. I'm going to, yeah, I'm putting this in my little podcast folder <laughs> to look at. It's a fantastic website, and I absolutely adore this person's analysis of time travel. Hold on. The first thing I see in the sidebar is Terminator, and then under Terminator, addendum to Terminator. So you know what kind of website this is. <laughs> So, if you thought that I was going on a little rant the other day about Ocarina of Time, wait till you see this guy's website. It's fantastic. Has the phrase, addendum to 12 monkeys, ever been written elsewhere in the English language? I highly doubt it. So, he's got Primer on here, as you do, because if you have a time travel website, if you don't discuss Primer, they take away your license. But then under that, he's got Primer Questions, because nobody understands that movie. <laughs> You can read about Primer, but then if you still have... It's, it's like a Primer FAQ. A Primer for Primer, if you would. Uh, this is great. I'm going to spend hours on this site now. I love that there's an entry for Hot Tub Time Machine. If ever a time travel movie needed analyzation more. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. I kind of wish that he did video games. I would love to see his take on Chrono Trigger. Because Chrono Trigger uses two distinct and mutually exclusive explanations for its time travel like in one set you can go back to the past and change things in another set you can't go back to the past and change things 
Right. So there's basically two schools of thought for time travel. There's one through line time travel mm -hmm. and there's a multiverse theory, right. which is every time you time travel, you create essentially a new universe, which is the Dragon Ball Z school of time travel, interestingly enough. If you scroll down on this main page, which will be linked in the show notes if you go down and you want to peruse yourself, he's got three models for time travel. Oh. <laughs> so the first one is called an end jump. You go to the future, then you travel back to the past and arrive at a point in a new like timeline, and then you go to the you just don't tra time travel again. You've just moved back once, so it's shaped like an end, right? Right. He's got an infinity loop where you do that same thing, but then you travel back in time a second time and arrive where you started from, and so you just created this infinite time loop. Okay. And then he's got what's called a sawtooth snap, which I love this phrase. He had to have coined this phrase. I want to see how many drafts he went through naming this thing. He probably called it like the shoots and ladders at one point. He probably called it the uh, <laughs> the quad in, the multi in. In the sawtooth snap, you travel back to the past again, but the circumstances on your second travel back were different because the future you're leaving from is different. And so you just infinitely travel back to the past without ever arriving back at your original timeline, in which case all future history is doomed. So all of his analyses are based on the model of this particular theory of time travel, that all time travel has to land in one of these three models. And if it doesn't, the theory is broken somehow. Something is wrong. Okay. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this, but you're right. You know, well, you know, that's a niche you could fill. You could be the um, time travel video game guy. Be the change you want to be in the world. <laughs> you got to enjoy recently my favorite story from 2017. What remains of Edith Finch? Oh, fantastic game. Fantastic. Of the ones that I've played so far, easily my favorite of the derisively referred to walking simulators <laughs> slash narrative games. Not derisively anymore. They've kind of, much to my chagrin, the community seems to have adopted the phrase walking simulator. I would call it a first person narrative game because walking really is the key difference between it and what my wife has been playing a lot of, which is a phone narrative game where you just pick choices from a menu and it's all text and pictures besides that. She's playing um, interactive novels, basically, right. which are fine. But for whatever reason, the act of walking around in the environment adds so much to me that I really love about these kinds of games. I definitely want to get into the whole what does stuff like Edith Finch mean for video games discussion, but first I would really just like to, to talk about Edith Finch. This is kind of my white whale, because I have such a hard time getting my peoples to play through Edith Finch that when I finally get somebody to play through it, I'm like, oh cool, now I can have a really good discussion with them about it. Which is crazy because, first of all, I wish I had played this. Well, I played it because it was free on the... Um, Epic Store. Mm -hmm. So I would say to people, we haven't seen this yet, but I wonder if stuff will cycle on the Epic Store. And if it does, please go get it. But really, just go pay for it. It's like a three-hour game. I think Edith Finch is worth the full asking price. It was $20 at launch. I think it's absolutely worth $20. I, I would agree. I, I think people will scoff at the, at the short playtime and the low replayability that's inherent to these kinds of games, but I think you're paying for one of the best examples of narrative in game. I mean, that's what you'd pay for a new Blu-ray back in the day, so. I think you have to play through Edith Finch at least twice. Because, like, your first pass, you're not really sure what's going on as the whole story unfolds, and then that gives you enough context when you go through it a second time to see everything in a different light. That's something that's not easy to do, and I'm almost certain it was deliberate. I have not played it twice, but I did play it and then watch everything on YouTube I could consume about it. I actually was going to replay it before recording and just never got around to it because of the other thing I had to do <laughs> that we'll talk about later. You had homework for this podcast. It was good homework, though. I liked it. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's spoiler warning at this point, because I think we should talk a little bit about what Edith Finch is. I don't want to go through the story bit by bit because it's a bit much and there's Way better resources to completely analyze it. Like, uh, what's the guy's name that you like? Joe Anderson. Yeah, he does a video called The Villain of Edith Finch, which I just rewatched a couple days ago in preparation for recording tonight. So what I would recommend to people is play Edith Finch and then watch that video. Because <laughs> <laughs> I really think that they, it works 
really well as a companion piece uh what, what he did and really helped form my my final opinion of it it helps that i agree with him <laughs> which always helps with criticism all right we beat around the bush long enough the first time I learned about Edith Finch was in a video on Super Bunny Hop's channel. He's a game reviewer and journalist. And he focused on one part of it, which turned out, in his opinion, to be the most interesting form of interactive storytelling he's ever seen. And I think Joe touched on it in his video, too. But there's the cannery level at the end of... Right. It's like the last main chapter of the game. I think the reason the cannery level works so well is because it builds on everything you've done throughout the entire game. You've had various levels of control over the interactive fictions. You know, it starts off really strong with the little girl who has the sort of dream sequence. Mm -hmm. I want to kind of want to talk about that first before we get to the cannery because the dream sequence works so well because you enter the game and it's this very strange environment and it's very interesting storytelling. But if you've played Gone Home or a similar kind of game, you kind of are like, okay, this is going to be an exploring the house game. And then you jump out that window and turn into a cat and you're immediately like, okay, this is going to be a different kind of game. And it dramatically changes the tone of the game and the play style of the game. You're still effectively walking from context point to context point. But it signals to you this is going to be a different kind of game. And then you go through the game and there's different play styles throughout it. Some are more or less interactive. And they all have to do with kind of the imagination of the character you're in. And then you get to this penultimate segment, which is the, the older brother of the title character, Edith Finch. And the entire story is about him getting lost in his imagination. But the key part is you have to keep doing the redundant task of working in the cannery that doesn't go away you could probably brute force your way through it without doing his job but the fish clog up the screen like they literally will take over the screen the way you're controlling this with your left thumb or your keyboard i guess you are controlling inside of his daydream moving his character around and then with your right thumb or your i guess mouse you're chopping the heads off fish and if you don't do the fish part correctly your whole screen fills up with fish and you can't see what's going on right and Two things have happened by this point. One, every character you've played as has died. <laughs> that's not a spoiler. Like, that's on the Steam page for the game. I said spoiler warning, so people should have taken the three hours to go play this game by now. <laughs> Did they all die in the generation? They do, don't they? We were watching their deaths. Yes. You're seeing the story of their death as told by someone else in their family. I think Molly's an exception to that because Molly's writing in her own journal. Yeah, Molly writes her fever state, basically, which is really unnerving once you realize what's going on <laughs> and that's another thing this game does really well is your first introduction to each character is very lively and colorful and happy and it always gives their inevitable death a very it's a very bleak game without being like i'm draped in black and covered in blood right. like it is such a well-made game um but anyway so at first i was being excruciatingly careful moving the fish because I was like, I'm going to take this dude's hand off and he's going to bleed out. And that's just <laughs> the way that the scenario is going to end. And it subverts that if you actually push the limits, which I did eventually kind of by accident and like, it will not let you stick your hand into it. It has sort of a, an invisible wall and you play through this gorgeous scene. And it does such a good job of building up from like simple graphics until eventually your dream is taking up all of the screen, except for the occasional fish that falls down. And then in the end, you bow your head to get your crown, and it's you sticking your head into the fish chopping machine. And it's really sad and really disturbing because it does such a good job. The whole time the narration is, it's through the voice of this letter from his therapist talking about the tragedy of his death. And she's talking about his escapes because he has this screwed up family and this screwed up life, and he has something going on with him mentally, and he just finally kills himself but is apparently very happy when he does it he's the only one in the family who does kill themselves everybody else's death is either an illness or an accident or a murder or something like that his is the only one that is a suicide i would say almost every other death besides his is some form of neglect or outright abuse yes but it doesn't outwardly seem like it at first the whole game's based around this idea that this family is cursed which they are cursed they're cursed by their belief in their curse <laughs> so it's a curse that 
your character Edith Finch is going back to the house that she grew up in to learn about these stories for the first time. And it's presented as there's a curse on the family. There's something supernatural going on here. Right. In the first few chapters, the first few areas of the house that you reach kind of set up for this later reveal of what this supernatural curse is. What happened in the old country with great grandma and her dad coming over on the boat. But as you play through the game, and this is what I really, really appreciated about this, because I'm a skeptic, Mm -hmm. and it's not only that I don't believe in supernatural stuff, it burns me up when I find out that people do (laughs) believe in supernatural stuff. Like In a story, I'm fine with ghosts and curses and stuff, but what I really liked about this is there is no ghost, there's no curse, and Edith, even in voiceover partway through the game, when she's ruminating over the first few chapters that she's been through, she's like... These stories are the problem. The idea that we were cursed led so many of my cousins and uncles and whatnot to their early deaths. And she even says, like, I probably shouldn't be telling you this. And the you you find out later is our unborn son. And she's like, I think these stories are what's killing us. And that's exactly what it is. It's the self-fulfilling prophecy of her ironically long-lived great-grandmother. And I think what it is is that her great-grandmother suffers some, we'll call it tragedy for now, throughout her life. And then as she gets older and sees so much of her family die off, she starts to believe that the family is cursed, despite the fact that she herself is apparently hill and hardy into like her 90s. <laughs> That's the kind of the big mystery of the game. Like, how much of this curse do the various members of the family believe? Like, I think it's very clear that your character, Edith, doesn't believe it at least by the midway point of the story. She knows she doesn't buy into this idea of a curse. Right. So here's my read on, because her great-grandmother's name is also Edith, and she's the one that Joe Anderson says is the villain. Right. And they call her Edie in-game, just to keep it simple. <laughs> she almost has this, like, death porn fascination. Like, she revels in death. Like, not in a macabre way, just... Psychologically, they call that a death drive. A death drive? Yeah, it's used in psychology, and then it's used a lot of times in literary criticism. That is 100% what this is. She has what's called a death drive, or thanatos, sometimes it's called, too. It's a Freudian thing, which basically means she is obsessed with death. Not that she wants to die, she's just obsessed with the concept of death, why people die, and it tends to end up being their undoing. Again, not necessarily their death, their undoing, with, as you see with her whole family dying around mm-hmm. her. And she does, she celebrates all of her family's death. It is really like she revels in it. So I think she, uh, Grandma Edie, like, I, I think she does buy into the curse. I think she's all in on this supernatural ghost. Because the first chapter you play through is Molly. Molly's a 10-year-old girl who was a baby when Edie came over from, I think, Norway, was it? Yeah, it was Norway. The first chapter is Molly uh, sent to her room without supper. And she gets hungry, and she eats stuff in her room that makes her very sick, and she dies by morning. She eats some old hamster food, she eats an entire tube of toothpaste, and she eats some um, holly berries, I think is what it was. She begs to be let out at one point, and Edie tells her to go to bed, and she's locked in from the outside, which is interesting given that the structure of the house that you're going through is all these doors being locked, you know, so. Nowadays, obviously, this is something we would call CPS on a parent for, but back in the 1940s, I think this was 1940-something, sending your kid to bed without dinner and then locking them in the room was just... (laughs) <laughs> father knows best kind of parenting it was classic punishment um <laughs> that doesn't make it right and i think that that's why you can still say that all of the deaths are in some way neglect because Edie basically sends her kid to bed and her kid eats all this poisonous stuff and dies before she does that she apparently falls asleep has a crazy fever dream wakes up writes about it in her diary and then goes back to bed convinced there's a monster under her bed that's going to kill her uh which we'll just call uh, food poisoning. (laughs) So the circumstances under which Edie, she comes across the ocean with her husband and her father and her baby daughter at the time. And her, they're they're bringing their house from Norway. Like (laughs) that's a great visual, by the way, like they have like these stills and they're like, what is happening? The idea is in the old country in Norway, the, the, the Finch family had this curse that they were label laboring under the independently wealthy family. They have no want for anything. But to try to get away from this curse, which has already been plaguing them in Norway, they sail their house across the Atlantic, they get within eyeshot of the U.S., and it sinks. And Edie's father goes down with it, he never makes it to shore. 
So even before she gets to America with her family, there's already a death. The end of the game, because you play a chapter for every character, all of Edie's kids, and then one of Edie's kids makes it to adulthood and has another generation of kids, and they all have chapters. And then there's a third generation, which includes your character, Edith. Yeah, your character, Edith, and your two brothers, basically. You get to what you think is going to be Edie's chapter. And there was, like, there was a big earthquake out at sea, and it sucked all the water out from around the house built on land. So she was able to walk out into the ocean bed and see the wreckage of the house. And as she got closer to it, it lights up. And just at that point, Edith isn't able to finish reading the story because her mother yanks the book she's reading out of her hand and doesn't let her finish it. The visual I think is really interesting is if you look at the house in that chapter, Edie is saying that she sees it as it was in the old country. Right. And the light turns on on the second floor. The house in the U.S., they never repurpose any of the rooms. Every time a child dies, Edie keeps their room like a shrine to them. So when the next generation is born, they have to live in the attic. Right. And then when the next generation beyond that is born, she literally starts building more rooms. Frankensteined off this house. Oh, it's a great looking, like, crazy tower house. But she had to have learned that from someone, right? It they, That had to have been how they do it in the old country. Edie... She had to have been the second generation in the old country. Like, all the whole bottom floor of her house was all her dead aunts and uncles that she never got to meet. I hadn't even thought about it that far. I just thought it was like a light turns on in the house. I thought, thought about Edith Finch a lot over the past two years. Every chapter you play ends with a death except Edie's, and Edie's gets snatched from you. So, in a way, the game kind of sets you up for that one not being completed. There was no reason for that chapter to have ended, Mm -hmm. because none of the other chapters end until somebody dies, basically. Up until that point, it really feels like this is where we're going to get the big supernatural reveal. We're going to learn about the ghost or the curse or whatever, and then you just don't get to. Mom takes it away because she says, you got to stop filling your head with this stuff, and takes her kid. Because the plan was, this was the last night in the house. Her mom had decided after their her second son died like one son vanished you don't actually know for a fact that he's dead but it's heavily implied he is and then what's his name chops his head off at the cannery and so she says i'm getting my daughter out of this house and we're leaving and as you're driving off you see Edie on the porch and she dies that night and it's not explicit but it's implied that she overdosed on basically wine in her medicine so it's implied that Edie finally commits suicide she finally gives into the death drive She's left alone in her big empty house and decides it's her time. I hadn't thought that Edie had committed suicide. That's an interesting thought. Oh, that is 100% the my take on it when when I saw it, was that she submits to the death drive. Like, she's been obsessed with death her whole life, and then she's finally left alone, and she says, it's my time. She doesn't want to go to a home. That's the whole thing. She says that the people will be in the morning to a a nursing home. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I'll bet you're right. Yeah, she totally doesn't want to leave that house alive. My read on it was, after Don and Edith drive away, Edie doesn't have anyone else's death to look forward to other than her own. Right. That too. There's no more kids, there's no more cousins, there's no grandchildren. Like, unless Edith's brother walks back in out of the woods after being missing for ten years and he dies, but... (laughs) So what was your take on Don and Edith's deaths? Because this is my biggest problem with the game, with the narration. I think it kind of falls apart at the end. Kind of the whole subtext to the game is that everybody in this family shares in Great Grandma Edie's death drive, except for Edith, because she never learned the stories growing up. Right. She was too young. They lived in the house with her two brothers, and one of her brothers vanished. And at that point, her mom says, okay, no more death stories. We're locking up all the rooms. I'm not exposing Edith to any of this. They continued to live in the house for another, uh, I don't know, a couple of years. But eventually, Edith's other brother kills himself. Because he had been exposed to all these stories. He had all of this bottled up inside of him. I think the end of the game, because after they drive away, they do kind of go through Dawn is Edith's mother, and then Edith's death, kind of very quickly. And so Dawn is sick. And dies in a hospital. You see her wearing the hospital bracelet, holding Edith's hand. And then Edith dies in childbirth, giving birth to her nameless son, who you get to see at the very end of the game, putting a flower on her grave. 
I think the reason that those deaths are kind of just paved over, they're so quick, is because Edith doesn't view them in the same reverence as her great-grandmother did. It's just something sad that happened in her life, and then nobody was there to kind of have reverence for her own death. There was nobody left in the family. So, on one hand, I get it. It works narratively because by the end of the game, you've broken the curse and that there is no curse. Like, you've realized there's no curse. And so you have these final two deaths, which are not supernatural in any way. They just happen. They die like people die. Sometimes people die young. I had one thought that is not actually supported in any way in the context of the game, but it's my little, like, personal theory. And my personal theory is Dawn was sick when they left the house. And that's part of why she felt like she had to get out of that house. She had something brewing and hadn't told anyone about it and decided she didn't want to die in this house and be part of her mom's mythology. I think I got, I kind of assumed that. There might be something there because that popped in my head. And she was like, you can't keep telling her these stories. I think she the last thing she wanted was for her to die and for Edith to be left with Edie and have her death be mythologized. So let's talk about Dawn for just a, just a second. What we know of Dawn is she is a teacher and a published author, mm -hmm. but she's not working as a teacher by the time her and Edith end up leaving the house. Well, she's homeschooling the kids. Right, but she's not working in like a public school. But she's not working. Thing. My understanding is the reason that she moved back into her grandmother's house was because her husband, Sanjay, had died. Right. She moved to India. She tried to get out of the house once already. Yes. And she moved to India and married a man, and had three kids, and then he died. He was a organizer, I think was kind of the impl implication. Like he was helping organize, you know, for progressive movements yes. or something yeah. over there. Through political movements. And, and... Um, protests turned into a riot and he got killed, I think was the implication. Because Sanjay, first of all, he wasn't one of the Finches, and also because he dies far away from Edie, like, his death isn't part of the mythology. He has a tombstone out in the family cemetery. Oh, that graveyard. <laughs> that is a big part of Edie's. <laughs> the graveyard and the weird, like, painted tree stumps. And uh, I think one of my favorite little details is, well, there's two little details. Uh, one, Edith talks explicitly about. She goes to Edie's room and sees the half-finished painted one of her brother. He had died, like, that week. And she already had it, like, almost finished painting before they left the house. <laughs> um, my other favorite detail is when you go into the basement and you find a pile of them mm -hmm. just waiting for, like, more than there are currently living family members. <laughs> <laughs> like, she's, like, that prepared for deaths. And then you have the graveyard, which is just has all these interesting little touches on all the gravestones that are part of the mythology. They're all these, like, references to the mythologized deaths that people have. Every tombstone has a little flourish on it. And Lewis, Edith's brother who kills himself, has a little crown on it. That means he had to have been telling Edie about his fantasies. Yes, exactly. He's, telling, he's explaining, like, hey... She, probably every day at dinner. Hey, Lewis, tell me about what's going on in the kingdom this week. And he's, oh, I've talked to the Queen of Hearts or whatever, and she says I can go and get my crown. Like, oh my god, it's so twisted. That's not, that doesn't actually happen in the story, but it's kind of the only way it could have happened, just based on the details yeah. in the story. But she had this ready. She had to have had it ready. Otherwise, there's no explanation for why... That gravestone exists because he died like a week or two before they left the house. But that's why I thought the implication was Dawn was sick and couldn't take care of her kids on her own. That's why she moved back into the house to be taken care of by Grandma Edie, who's independently wealthy. She builds all these extra rooms for them. She can homeschool her own kids and live in relative comfort until one of her sons vanishes. Right. I thought Dawn's illness was a, like a long time coming i don't think she sprung it on anyone that's not the read that i got from it i was thinking maybe she was keeping it from Edie, from edith because she does she she kind of says mom got sick after they left and i think what happened was is i think she took a turn well from dawn's point of view that would have had to be a hard thing to tell either of the ediths because if you tell this to your daughter without her knowing this family legacy and mythology of glorifying death like that's got to be a weird thing but going the other way and telling Edie. Like, hey, Grandma, like, I got I got my diagnosis here. And Grandma says, ah, I've got a tree stump in the garage waiting for you. Aha, I'm going to make your uh, gravestone. It's going to look like a cancerous cell. 
because I assume it was cancer. I mean, I just I'm trying to think of what what would kill you slowly, and I'm thinking it's cancer that's come back or something. You know, the other little detail about Dawn is Dawn is the only person in the entire extended Finch family who's religious. Yeah. I mean, I guess I don't know the religions of anybody in the Finch family, but she is specifically a Christian, and she's the only one that has any kind of religious iconography anywhere in her area. I think that's important for a part of her rejection of Edie's death drive, because to her, death takes on a completely different meaning as a religious woman than it would for someone who's just this old woman who's obsessed with death, which is funny because a lot of ways i think christians have a weird death drive but at the same time something about her religion maybe pushing her to you know do better for her kids or something i'm not exactly sure how it would how that would work out so what was your what was your issue with the the way that these two final stories these two final deaths ended you just thought they kind of wrapped up too neatly too quickly i thought dawn's and edie's edith's do kind of collide on each other a little bit um I kind of understand why, because like you said, they're not part of the mythology. So that, I just felt a little bothered by Edith's death because I didn't super feel like it was earned. I get that tragedies happen, but I don't know. It just sort of hit me out of the blue. Like I should have realized she was going to die at the end. Like I absolutely should have known she's going to die at the very end. I guess what I didn't expect was for her to die in childbirth like that. You know? Uh, So I assumed she was going to die the entire game because the game is called What Remains of Edith Finch. Right. And if you're paying any attention at all, the game opens with a different person than you're playing as. Somebody opens up the journal and you you come to find out later it's her son. But somebody opens up the journal who's got a cast on their arm and he's carrying lilies, for God's mm-hmm. sakes, which are death flowers. There are two characters named Edith Finch and you could be going through the game. Like what remains of Grandma Edie is just this legacy of morbid fascination with her family's death. What remains of the girl Edith is this unnamed son and freedom from this family curse and this infinite possibility or maybe he'll just step in front of a train next tuesday we have no idea the game doesn't go there well i mean and he clearly has something going on because he goes to the house somebody buried edith at that house for one thing who the hell did that i maybe she specified it in her in her will the finch family was wealthy And Edie dies right after Dawn and Edith leave, so that money must have gone somewhere. They must have still had access to it. Like, some executor of the estate must have known, oh, there's a family plot. Edith, unfortunately, dies in childbirth. We'll go ahead and bury her there, and we'll just keep the key to the house for when Junior grows up. We'll give him the creepy storybooks and, uh... Now, we don't know anything about unnamed Junior, but he looked much younger than Edith. Like, he was 11, 12... He looked like a young child, uh, which is a little unnerving, given that now you're like, well, he's marked for death now. (laughs) (laughs) Like, he's going to go there and go down to the basement, and that creepy totem pole is going to fall over on him or something? The wiki apparently calls him Christopher. Maybe somewhere on his cast, somebody references him as... uh, Why would you sign somebody's name on their own casts? Get well soon, Christopher? Well, I guess. Oh, no, never mind. The, a, a developer just, somebody randomly asked him what his name was, and he was like, his name's Christopher. Can't remember if he actually got in the na- in there somewhere. <laughs> so there's one chapter of Edith Finch. Every time that somebody plays through it, I want to get their take on this specific chapter, because half of the people that I've gotten to play it are degenerates like me who are going to be childless forever, because <laughs> children are gross and dumb. And the other half are people who are my age, who are normal, who have now procreated and have babies. Well, you know which camp I'm in. (laughs) When I streamed this game, we got to this point. It was hard for some of the people in my Twitch chat to watch. So it's Gregory's chapter. So Gregory's chapter comes right around halfway through the game. Maybe maybe slightly to the end. But you've gone through a handful of these already. You kind of know the score. Um, It is critically after... You hear a lot about the curse, and I don't know if I should be telling you these stories, etc., etc. And then you go through a secret passage into the attic, which is apparently where half the family lived, because Edie was crazy and locked up rooms. You go through the attic, you go into a secret passage, and you stop cold in your tracks because you see a freaking crib. And then you reach into the crib and you find a copy of divorce papers. And on the bottom of the divorce papers, Edith's grandfather has written a long note to Edith's grandmother, basically saying, you're not at fault for what happened to Gregory. And then you start playing the game. 
And as soon as you take control of, you know, you're like a foot tall sitting in a bathtub, you just go, I don't want to play this chapter. (laughs) I super don't want to play this chapter. I about walked away. I'm not even kidding. I had a real hard time getting through this one. It's rough. And as soon as it starts, you're like, I know that this is going to end. You assume the kid's probably throwing toys around, but the way it plays out is you're playing as a toy frog that's just bouncing and happy and making stuff happen in the bathtub. You like hop on the soap and it makes bubbles fly up and you fall in the water and I think you get some like fish to follow you around and you know, you just have all these toys that are and it's playing like classical music, which I interpreted that as mom was playing that in the next room or something. It reminded me of like the Blue Danube or something. An old like Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies soundtrack. Oh, I'm sure Looney Tunes used it a lot. Yeah, it was one of those. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, my wife could tell me what the who that is probably, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Mom comes in and drains the bathtub, which first of all, she, this is where the neglect thing super comes in. You shouldn't have been alone in the bathtub at all at this point. Like, mm-hmm. not not even for a second do you leave a kid that small in the bathtub. And she's on the phone arguing with her husband, who's away at this point. And uh, she comes in and drains the bathtub. And then Mr. Frog hits the tap and it starts filling back up. Then it, like, transitions to you're swimming in the ocean. And then you go down a drain. And then you're a dead baby. Everybody who's listening to this is hopefully going to go play through Edith Finch and then watch Joe Anderson's video. But... J- his Joe Anderson's style is he gives this very kind of methodical and analytical take on every game he talks about. And he's not like emotionless, but he tries to keep a very even tone when he talks about Gregory's chapter in Edith Finch being a new parent himself at the time that he made that video. That's the only time in that hour long video he gets angry. Like he sounds really mad at Gregory's mother for walking away from the bath. This is part of his thesis, is that the death drive is really just neglect. It's an excuse to be lazy. It's an excuse to be careless. And he's like, you do not leave a child unattended in the bath like that. You just don't do it. But this family is so used to death. This family expects death. And so they bring it upon themselves. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And he's right. He's 100% right in his in his analysis of it. And <laughs> and And yeah, I got super angry during that point and i got super sad and i got super upset and i about walked away from the game which would have been a shame because there's so much good stuff after that yeah yeah no i pushed through part of it is the presentation is so happy like he keeps talking about oh he was such a happy boy he was always smiling he was always laughing and you got this this melodic symphony playing and you get the happy things and that's the whole thing is that you know he went out smiling which he didn't he went out gurgling you know it was a horrible horrible way to die yeah, the game is never violent Mm -mm. it's never gory it's never like dreadful you never well there's the comic book that's kind of tales from the crypt keeper a little bit the comic book's interesting because it is gory but it's literally looks like comic book panels like it's done in a way that it's super stylized yeah every every chapter is like that every chapter has a fantasy way of explaining how the character in that chapter dies but it's never dark or gritty or edgy. It's always presented as being almost beautiful. Like, you almost get into Grandma Edie's mindset. Yeah, death is beautiful is definitely a theme for her. It's so weird because the game is so full of contrast because you do get her death is beautiful, but then it's contrasted by Edith's reaction to it, which is always like, I can't believe they kept this from me. Like, especially um, her uncle who, like, apparently lived under the house while she was living there, and she had no idea. (laughs) And that one was super effed up. Like, Edie's just like, sure, you could live under the house. I will buy into this fantasy of yours. I will keep you under the house, you know, in a bunker for 30 years or whatever it was. I have a timeline that I made in a spreadsheet. (laughs) Oh, wow. Because I I wanted to find all this information out. So the timeline goes something like this. Walter and Sam... Are, are Grandma Edie's last two remaining sons. Her other children are all dead by this point. Sam goes off to war. He goes off to fight in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. After he leaves for Vietnam, that's right around the time that Walter has a breakdown and moves under the house. Well, and he has a breakdown because he witnesses his sister getting murdered. 
Right, but that was that was some years earlier. Oh, okay. So my my take on it is that he was home when his older sister Barbara was murdered. Barbara's the one that has the comic book made of her later. Right. Which again, super effed up. Yeah, my daughter was brutally murdered in my house. You can write my story in a comic book. Can I please have a copy for her death shrine? Not just you can have the story, it's I will give you details that only I could know. So Walter was traumatized by that. But at the time, his older brother Sam is still living at home. Mm -hmm. So it's just him and Sam and Grandma Edie at the time. There's nobody else there. Well, when did Calvin die? Calvin dies somewhere in there, too. Very young. Calvin dies the year after Barbara. He's just younger. Yeah, because it's Molly, Barbara, Calvin. I'm looking at the the in-game family tree right now is what I'm looking at. (laughs) Yeah, Calvin is Sam's twin brother. and he, He dies as a young child. Sam gets to grow up. Calvin doesn't. Sven must die somewhere in there, too. I'd have to open up my timeline, and I'm not going to do that. That's a rabbit hole I don't want to go down while we're recording. But there is a point in time where it's just Edie and Sam and Walter. And Walter's clearly troubled because he witnessed this murder. Mm -hmm. But my take on it is, like, Edie has this death drive, like you say. Sam just wants to get out of the house. And when he's 18, he joins the army and goes off to fight. And when that happens, that's when Walter has his breakdown and moves under the house. That's what the timeline works out to. Interestingly, Sam is Don's father. Yeah. But obviously, because he's the one who survives. And Sam gets out of the house for a time and is, then comes back. And Don mm-hmm. similarly gets out of the house for a time and then comes back. And so it's like that through the line through that part of the family tree has a similar trajectory. In fact, given Sam, Sam... I think clearly has PTSD. And I think that's why he ends up back in the house. I don't think it's a coincidence that he ends up back there. Either that, or it was just convenient for him and his wife to move back with their new kids. Was it convenient for them to live in the attic that I only saw like secret passages to get into? I think that he has PTSD because he even, he's a prepper. Like you see some evidence. He like goes out of his way to try to teach Don how to shoot because he gets paranoid his sketch looks super like uh, what's his name from King of the Hill. Like I, 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 I interpreted it 100% as he was messed up by the war. I had never thought about it at that angle, but I'll bet you're right. Because even like, his chapter, it's very warm and inviting. It's very, it's him and Dawn just having conversations, and she has her camera. And if you're quick, you can catch him peeing, and it's just this fun. But yeah, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet that that's that they set the tone that way to kind of distract you from the fact that he has these paranoias. Yeah, because if you explore his room and stuff, like there's definitely a lot of like paranoia about it. And and so what did he do? Did he go to Vietnam? I guess he went to Vietnam. Yeah, he must have gone to yeah, Vietnam. He, he fought in Vietnam and then he came home and married Kay and he and Kay had three children. The way Sam works is he's in a wealthy family, but at 18, he's gone. He goes off to war. And then the ti- the way the timeline works out, it must not be till after he leaves that Walter, because Walter, you get to see the calendar on the wall, the days passing that he's down in his bunker. Right. And the earliest dates that he's down there coincide with Sam turning 18. That makes sense. Yeah. So I guess being left alone in the house finally drove him, you know. Yeah, because after Sam leaves, it's just him and his mother, Edie, who is obsessed with everybody's death. The first floor of his house has a room for a sister who he's never met, who was dead before he was ever born. Right. From food poisoning. And his mother insists, oh, it wasn't food poisoning. She got eaten by a monster. Right. And and keeps telling him that. Oh, God. This game. This game really... I, I'm, I'm probably going to end up playing through it again now that we've sat yeah, and talked too. about it for an hour. <laughs> me too. So, other than Lewis, because I think unambiguously Lewis is probably the best part of the whole experience. It really does evoke that sense of being at a crappy job, just with your daydreams, just counting the minutes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It really creates that sense. So other than that, what do you think was the best presented story in this? I think that this game does the classic anthology thing where you start with your best and you end with your best. I think Molly and Lewis bookend the experience perfectly. And I think that those are my two favorites easily. From a gameplay, from a this is a video game perspective. 
uh, and maybe story-wise too. Like I think that there's a lot of good stuff in there. I had a lot of fun just flying the kite around. That was just very relaxing after a lot of like because <laughs> that one comes right after Gregory's scene, which was it is oh. yeah. It's kind of like a you can exhale now. Very much like even though yes, the kid dies, but he gives his father the finger, which you totally want to do at that point, <laughs> right? I don't know. It felt very you know sort of early PS3 you know art game flying around and literally gathering the letters to spell out stuff in the sky i'm trying to think okay let me let me phrase it a different way are were there any parts that you just thought were like meh no i like every story in isolation and i like what every story adds to the overall experience it's such a relatively short experience i think i played it in about two and a half hours like it's really about like watching a decent movie i think my favorite had to have been i really really like how milton's story was presented milton is edith's brother who vanished and he's an artist, and you find a little flip book that he made, and you flip this flip book, and it shows him painting a door on the wall of his bedroom, mm-hmm. and then taking a bow and walking through it. And that's all the information you ever get about Milton. And just like every other story in the game, it's very beautiful. The music, the artwork, it's presented in this extremely just artistic way at the same time his mother agonizes for years over whether he's still alive or not he just vanishes so edith she wasn't exposed to any of the deaths that came before she wasn't old enough but she had to have been exposed to milton's death finding that little flip book after going to the house and having all these questions answered about cousins and aunts and uncles and then getting to this flip book and getting this beautiful presentation but no new information. It doesn't yeah. solve the mystery. It doesn't give her anything. And you never hear about Milton after that. Nope, nope. He's He literally just vanishes. Uh, that flip book is great, too, because it's literally a flip book. They figured out how to make a flip book in the, in the engine. You can stop on individual pages and go forward and backwards. Like, I mean, it functions. <laughs> it's impossibly long for how big a flip book is, but it's still fun. I, that's also my favorite musical piece from mm-hmm. the whole game is Milton's chapter. That is apparently a reference to another game by the same developer. Uh, just that art style um, and the doorway and stuff is a reference to, I forget the name of it now, but th- th- it's basically their previous thing, which I don't think it's come on anything other than PlayStation 4, so I'm not going to get to play it. The canonical explanation is that Milton walks through the magic door into this other game, but... Ah, that's one of those death of the art author things. I choose yeah, to believe yeah. this is just fantastical because that shatters the rest of the theme of the game. Like he ran away. He's a kid who either ran away or more likely because of the neglect of the family theme, probably just wandered off into the woods or the, or the ocean one day and nobody knew where he went. And they just said, Oh, he vanished. So the very, very first scene of the game, well, it's the second. So the first scene is you're on the boat and you've got Edith's journal and the lilies. But the second scene of the game is Edith has gotten into the fence surrounding the family house and you're out in these woods and you've got to walk through these woods to get to the house. My second time through, I I played it through once myself and I played it through once with my wife. So this was my third time through. I spent an inordinate amount of time out in those woods thinking I'm going to find something, a bone, a skull, Mm -hmm. a, a scrap of cloth of his shirt. There's nothing out nope, there. Not I a really thing. looked. Literally, the only thing that you could possibly, 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 if you really stretched it, is if you turn around at the very beginning, you could see the fence has been torn up a little bit. And she says, I guess I'm not the first person to come in here. So you could maybe make a super stretch that he like climbed back in because he's older now and wanted to come explore, but that doesn't make any sense. He's just gone. He's dead. He's just, probably. He's just gone. So one thing I did do is I played Edith Finch, and then I had it in my head. I was like, I want to play more narrative games. So then I immediately played Gone Home afterwards. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. (laughs) Gone Home is a cute little game, but Gone Home is what I thought Edith Finch was going to be when I first started playing it, before the turning into a cat scene happened. I feel like Edith Finch does everything Gone Home tries to do so much better, and a lot of it is budget and presentation. And Gone Home is a nice little story, but I mean, I almost certainly got it like on a bundle at some point. I mean, it's fine. I think it's worth playing. I just, and now I'm giving this advice after telling people that they should have already played Edith Finch by now. (laughs) Um, Sorry. Uh, But yeah, people should definitely have played Gone Home before Edith Finch, because I feel like Edith Finch takes the legacy and whatever of Gone Home and really builds on it. Like it's so much more imaginative. But then I started playing Life is Strange and I'm only 
two or three episodes in, but that's really good so far. I like Life is Strange a lot. It, what it does differently is it gives you decision points. So at the end of your chapter, you can go and look and see what your decisions lined up with the rest of the world, like during the Walking Dead game. The only other purely narrative game I've played of, like this, of this modern cache that we have going on has been Firewatch. See, that's on my list too. That's on my uh, Steam list. I haven't gotten to it yet. I think Gone Home and Firewatch both have the same problem that is keeping them from gr the greatness that Edith Finch achieves is that both of them have like a core idea that at some point in their development, the writers or the programmers or somebody said, that idea is enough. All we have to do is have that idea in there and people will praise us. Like for Gone Home, it's okay to spoil Gone Home, right? That game, yeah. It's, it's, forever, it's been forever ago. You go in and it's, it's like, is it going to be a haunted house? Is it a ghost story? You're not really sure. The story is her little sister's gay and ran off with her girlfriend. Yes. And it's cute. It's a really sweet story. I do recommend it, but it really feels like they're just banking on getting some points for having the lesbian love story, and that's all they had to do. I think my problem with Gone Home wasn't even the story. It was the engine. Because one thing about Edith Finch is Edith Finch drips with atmosphere. There's so much stuff you can look at. But your actions are fairly limited. Things light up when you can when you can pick them up, interact with them. Gone home, clearly they're like, we have this, I don't know, Unity or whatever physics engine. So we will let you pick up literally everything in the damn game. And it's completely unnecessary. And it's just tedious trying to walk through this game and like pick up every little book, expecting it to be interesting or important. And it's just not... <laughs> <laughs> Firewatch has the same problem. It's uh, it's much more of a game than the rest of these narrative things. Like you can actually fail at least temporarily in Firewatch because it's all about navigating this big forest and getting lost. Okay, I enjoyed it, and again, I do recommend it. But it really felt like these guys were, hey, we we succeeded in making this big forest, and if you turn off the mission markers, it's totally possible to get lost. And that's enough. We can People will praise that aspect of it. And that's exactly what happened in the reviews of Firewatch when it was new. Yeah. People were just like, these woods are so deep, are so big. Yeah, I got, I got lost in these woods. And it's the sensation of following using just a paper map and a compass that you hold in your hand. In the, but that one thing was not enough to carry the experience for me. And it was the, similar with Gone Home. Like that one thing, that one plot twist that everything hangs on wasn't enough for me. I really feel like Edith Finch has depth and complexity that these other narrative games don't have yeah i think the thing about the thing about gone home was and like i said i think i would have enjoyed it a lot more if i had played it first because i feel like it's sort of like the indie movie and then edith finch is the one that has a budget in a lot of ways uh, and i think my problem with it is i kept expecting something to happen i kept expecting something either fantastical to happen or something horrible to happen and it's really just you exploring your house and finding out about your sisters, what your sister's been up to while you're in college. And I'm kind of like, cool. You know, when this game takes place, they had phones. <laughs> in fact, that's how the story starts. You walk in the house and you play the answering machine because it's 1993 and you have answering machine. You have to actually push a button on. And keep a tape inside. What? And at one point, you find a note or something that's talking about, oh, yeah, the old circuit's in this house, you know. So I went on and turned on literally every light in the house, expecting to, like, blow a fuse or something interesting to happen. And I think one light goes off one time in the house because the sister is convinced that, like, the house is haunted or something. So I'm like, oh, maybe there'll be ghosts. And then, they'll, you know, it's just nothing happens. Like, literally nothing happens. And I guess that's the point. The point is nothing happens. It's just a queer romance story, which, I don't know. That's fine. I didn't like Gone Home that much. I'm sorry. <laughs> One little detail in Gone Home is all of the doors in the house are hinged. You can open them either way. Mm -hmm. When I was playing it on stream, and when somebody pointed out, hey, you, that door's open in and out both ways, completely killed the experience. Because for the whole rest of the game, I spent a minute at every door just going in and out. <laughs> And now when I'm playing D&D, &D, my players will ask me, which way does this door open? Oh, all doors in this universe are gone home doors. They both open in all directions. <laughs> it was so dumb. And it was it just, 
I don't want to say it wrecked the experience because the story is very divorced from the experience of interaction. And that was the problem. That was that that was absolutely the problem. Edith Finch, the game is 100% about the interaction. Gone home, it's all you find a tape and you keep walking. I took everything out of the fridge at one point and then shoved it all back in until I could shut the door. So that was a good 10 minutes I wasted. <laughs> I probably spent 10 minutes throwing stuff into your little sister's basketball hoop. So let's talk about the other new hotness in this genre. I made a point to play Bandersnatch. And for those of you who don't know, again, go take two hours. It's on Netflix. You need to do it on something where you've got a mouse or a trackpad. Go do Bandersnatch. It is an interactive episode of Black Mirror. So before we get into Bandersnatch, you're in the camp that what remains of Edith Finch is a game. Oh yeah, 100%. It's a game. You play it with a controller, you interact with the environment. It's, it's Who cares if it's got a linear story? Most games have linear stories. Okay, now let's talk about Bandersnatch. Like, okay. I love Black Mirror. Mm -hmm. Huge fan of... I like despair porn in general. <laughs> Those <laughs> kinds of just really, really dark stories. And so Black Mirror takes my love of that kind of story and this it's like the twilight zone except nobody learns anything and everybody's miserable always right and i i was i was disappointed i thought bandersnatch was like a c plus black mirror story okay so here's my breakdown on bandersnatch i actually thought okay. about this a lot I heard about Bandersnatch, I think, around the time that I played Edith Finch. And, and I told you I played Edith Finch, and you were like, well, you've got to do Bandersnatch now because I want to have a topic. <laughs> and I was like, fair enough. Should I jump in or should I watch Black Mirror? And you were like, eh, watch some Black Mirror so you have a feel for it. I was like, fair. So I watched, I think I've seen three or four episodes of Black Mirror. I enjoy it. It's a show that I, I watch it, and then I feel like I need to have a lay down and just <laughs> and really think about what I'm doing with my life. Is it as hard to get through an episode of Black Mirror as it was to get through Gregory's chapter? Not yet, but they're eventually going to have an episode that will be that bad because I'm sure they're going to have an episode that involves children and I'm going to punch my screen. There's an episode in season three that's going to make you punch your screen. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm looking forward to it. So here's my sort of broad strokes take on Bandersnatch. I thought that it was a really interesting concept. I thought that they wasted it on an uninteresting story. Yes, I'm right there with you. I would agree with that. Bandersnatch is very much about the fact that it is Bandersnatch. Mm -hmm. It is 100% metatextual. It is all about the fact that you're controlling it. They even have a digression where you can choose the option, I am Netflix. For Which God's is sakes. funny. It's a good gag. Oh, it's hilarious. It's a great gag. But my two problems with Bandersnatch is it's 100% about being metatextual. And there's not... I guess there is a true ending because there is one ending that gets you like the credits in the role. So I guess there is a true ending, which is fine, whatever, but it doesn't feel like there's a true ending, you know, because mm -hmm. early on, the very first thing you do, you make like a couple of like meaningless decisions. You choose your breakfast cereal, then you choose a soundtrack for a scene. And then you get to a point where it's, it's kind of like, I thought it was going to be a but thou must situation. They're like, do you want to do this thing? And I said, well, yes, of course I want to do it. Otherwise, there's no goddamn story. And then you do it. The in-universe guy who knows what's going on, basically, it was like, mm, wrong decision. And then uh, <laughs> the game ends because you sell out to a company and you make the game Bandersnatch and then it doesn't sell. And then your guy's like, I'm going to do it again. So I thought, okay, this is going to be a path with branches, basically. I thought it was going to be basically one path, and then you keep taking little offshoots. And creatively, it doesn't do that. It makes some loops. And I thought that one thing that it did very well was the editing. It does a pretty seamless job, for the most part, of looping you back onto the story, except if you take a path where you literally fail or die, and then it takes you back to the last decision point. But there's a couple points where you can literally loop on the story. And I know this because I kind of fast-forwarded through it twice and chose a couple different routes. But you get to the end, and there's a few different ways that the thing can end, and none of them are satisfying, but I guess that's just Black Mirror? <laughs> <laughs> the media push for this was that it's a brand new kind of experience. It's the first ever choose-your-own-adventure story on Netflix. It's pushing a new kind of medium. You've never seen anything like this. That was all BS. Bandersnatch only has one ending, because every ending you get to is the same with some small variation. And I went through the entire story twice, looking for all the different paths and stuff. 
before I realized that's the point. That's the story of Bandersnatch is your decisions are meaningless. Someone else or something else is always in control. You're always going to end up at the same horrible spot. And they use the marketing gimmick of this being new technology. And it's this yeah, new... Yeah, the Sega CD could do this, man. <laughs> I mean, Snatcher did this. Which, <laughs> actually, now that I think about it. Wait, is that... No, I'm thinking of um, Housetrap. Is that the one? Uh, Night Trap. Night Trap. <laughs> Snatcher, Snatcher did not do this. Snatcher was a very different thing. Choose your own adventure stories are nothing new, obviously. They've been around forever, especially if you've played video games. We've had video games that have this kind of narrative forever and ever. But Bandersnatch specifically was like, let's take the choose your own adventure thing, tell everybody it's this new awesome thing, but then write a story where your choices don't matter, and your choices not mattering are the point of the story. It's layers and layers of Black Mirror, man. It is, and I get that that's Black Mirror and that's the point. My problem was, so when you play What Remains of Edith Finch, the fact that it is a narrative video game enhances the product. The fact that you can walk around and look at things and take things kind of at your own pace is enhancing the narrative. In Bandersnatch, the fact that you pick the options was the narrative. And I get it. It's meta narrative. It's cute. You know what this feels like? This feels like your reaction when you finally played Undertale and you were super underwhelmed because you're like, I've done this before and better. Whereas I thought, wow, Undertale is so good and so cool and I love it. And I do. I loved Undertale. But you had a very different experience because you were like, I've kind of done this before because you were in the RPG Maker community. I feel like as a gamer, I watched Bandersnatch and I was like, this is cute. I've played better meta games and I've played better <laughs> narrative games. You know, Pony Island is a meta game, but it's way more interesting than Bandersnatch <laughs> was when it comes to the meta narrative. Your decisions in Pony Island make as much of a difference in that game as your decisions in Bandersnatch make to the story of Bandersnatch. Yeah, and like I got to the Netflix ending and I kind of wanted more like that. I wanted more like not necessarily like it's funny endings, but I wanted more like where the hell did this story just go ending? I did enjoy that you could literally go take LSD and kill yourself. That was kind of fun. <laughs> that is one of the more unique ways to end the narrative, yes. It's not that every ending is just a variation on the same one. There are a couple of splinters that go in different places. But those places, the way they're presented in Bandersnatch are, this is a dead end. Go back and do it right this time. Which, to be fair, is the way most Choose Your Own Adventure books work. Most Choose yeah, Your Own Adventure books are a series of hubs and spokes, where you go to a point, and then you have like three deaths, or three bad endings, or three meh endings, and then you get to another branch. I mean, it is so on the nose that it starts off with your character is reading a Choose Your Own Adventure book called Bandersnatch, which I think they got in trouble for that, actually, because I believe Choose Your Own Adventure is copyrighted. I don't... God damn it. Now we have to have a two-hour discussion over how dumb that is, that you can <laughs> copyright the phrase Choose Your Own Adventure. Um, what have you done? <laughs> I, I, I'm going to look into that okay. and see if that's true. Let's, um, let's but, just never mention that again. Okay. <laughs> I think the one thing I really appreciate about Bandersnatch, and this is a very subtle thing, but I went back and I played a few different paths. I actually, I tried to do all the paths. And there's one point where you go to in-universe, I know what's going on guy. And he's like, you're having a bad time. You gotta get out of the hole. And he basically gets you to do LSC with him. But there's a point where he's like, do you want to do this? And you can choose yes or no. So the first time I played, I said, yes, of course. I totally want to take LSD in this game. And the second time I was like, no, let's see what happens. If you pick no... He spikes your tea. Yeah. And then when you ask him, what have you done? He says, I chose for you. Yeah. It's a little on the nose, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> the one guy in the universe who keeps telling you to choose different paths, to choose your own place, to be your own person. The one time he's directly in control of you and makes you make a choice, he makes it for you. <laughs> you mentioned the very first choice in the game that matters. All of the choices in the game are kind of like that. But the very first one that you make is set up that... They ask you a question that no reasonable person would say no to. Do you want to work for this company and make your game with us? And if you say yes, you get an immediate bad ending and you're kicked back to the decision point. I didn't get to see that. I went into the story <laughs> and I said, okay, I don't want to see the real ending right away. Oh, that's funny. 
I want to see all the little branches. So at every decision point, I'm going to make the most self-destructive choice I possibly can. <laughs> so when they asked, do you want to work for this company? I immediately said no. Every time, like, what decision is going to make my life worse? I chose that one. And doing that, you get through almost the entire story and then you get credits. Yeah. So I got to the end and I'm like, this was phenomenal. Because I can go back to the first point if all of the story branches are like that. Unfortunately, it's Black Mirror. And it turns out if you take a choice that's not self-destructive, it basically just always says bad ending, go check something different. <laughs> right. Ironically, it, the path you took almost sounds like the way you get to the closest thing the game has to a true ending, which is where it loops in on itself and you find out somebody's making Bandersnatch the video game that you're playing right now. <laughs> and the editing is exquisite. You'll see a scene and then you'll get a bad end. It'll loop back, but it, and you'll see the same scene, but there will be subtle changes. Mm -hmm. Like instead of seeing an entire conversation between two people, they'll have just a truncated version of it. Like, they know this is the second time you've seen this scene, so we don't have to go through it all again. And I like that in-universe guy, I keep calling him, his name's Colin, I think. I like the second time you play through and he's like, I've met you before, you know? <laughs> I like how you're doing his voice. Oh, he had such a distinctive voice. Yeah, I loved his voice. I mean, I hated his voice, but I loved that the way the actor played it. <laughs> you know what sucks, though? Bandersnatch might be the best thing they can do with this medium because it was purposely designed so the choice didn't matter. That enabled them to have all those really seamless edits in there and the loops always going to the proper places. If the choices did matter, it would probably quintuple the amount of scenes they have to shoot and edit. It would probably just become too much of a thing. So I'm really skeptical that Netflix is ever going to have another story with this technology that really uses it and makes the choices important. I don't think you have to make the choices quote unquote important. Edith Finch does not have important choices. I think you could do this where you have a few different paths that loop in on themselves and just tell a more interesting story with it. The dumbest example I can think of is if you're running through the woods and you're choosing left and right you don't have to have them go in two completely different directions. You can have the paths double back on themselves. And then a few paths lead you to a dead end. And then a few paths lead you to you die horribly. See, now you're describing Until Dawn. <laughs> which was an excellent narrative game on the PS4 that I highly recommend. I haven't played that one yet either. Yeah, I thought that I thought Bandersnatch was interesting. Because I'm a gamer and a lit nerd, I've seen metatextual stuff like this done to death it's like very very good very postmodern now can you tell an interesting story with this this next time and that's really how i came away feeling from bandersnatch yeah I, I didn't notice you see the seams a little bit more your second time through because when you click a choice it takes like 10 seconds and the first time you play it there's all this suspense like you click yes and then somebody's looking at you like well what are you going to do and uh <laughs> But then the second time you play it, you kind of feel the stalling for time while it's loading in the next scene so I can put it in seamlessly. There's a couple little details I noticed by my second time through. Um, I chose a different breakfast cereal, so naturally I got a different cereal commercial. Yeah. Um, when you very briefly see that later on, which sure. is fun. <laughs> I listened to all the music. I can't even remember how you get to this point, but there's a point where you can put in the tape of the game and so you just listen to, like, computer noises for 15 seconds, and that's <laughs> weird. So if you take the path where you go drop LSD with What's-His-Nut, and then he kills himself, because he says it doesn't matter, life is a circle, whatever, one of us is jumping off this roof, is it you or me? If you jump off the roof, you die, then you wake back up. If he jumps off the roof, he dies, then his wife turns into Bandersnatch and you wake up, and it's like a dream or something. And either way, you end up back in the car going to your shrink. If you play through the game and you don't drop LSD, when you get to the later parts of the end, Colin is there talking to the skeezy boss. If you do the scene where you drop LSD and then Colin kills himself, but then you reset time, even though you supposedly reset time, when you get to those very last scenes, there's an added scene where his wife who you only meet if you go drop LSD, comes in and demands to know where he's at. And he's not in those scenes. Yeah, it's a weird game, man. So Bandersnatch is also a game. Yeah, it's a game. I mean, if you put if this thing was on the Sega CD and you were toggling with a controller, you wouldn't even question that it's a game. Maybe you've picked up on this, but I don't like calling these narrative experiences games. And 
what I've noticed is when What Remains of Edith Finch was new, there was a big fights all over the internet about whether or not it was a game. People defending it, yes, it's a video game. And if you don't call it a video game, if you don't admit that it is, it's because you're insert slur of the week here. Bandersnatch, though, did not get released to video gamers. It got released to Netflix population. And so the word game never comes up once in the context of what you're playing on Netflix. They always pitch it as an interactive movie or the choose your own adventure Black Mirror episode. I think it's pretty clear that when the population got a hold of these things, like one of them was called a game and one of them wasn't. And I don't see a distinction between the two. They're both interactive narratives to me. It doesn't matter to me, honestly. <laughs> it matters to me so much. <laughs> and I think part of it, because I heard you the other day were arguing about JRPGs too. And okay. JRPGs versus action RPGs versus I am a person who is, genres are fluid and imprecise and I don't care that much. <laughs> I care so much. Like, <laughs> to me, it's, you read the back of a cereal box, okay? And it mm -hmm. says something about, there's fun stuff about Tony the Tiger. Maybe there's some zoo facts about tigers. Maybe there's a maze. And then you turn to the other side and it has the nutrition facts. You wouldn't call the back of the cereal box a book. You're not reading a book when you read the back of a cereal box. Okay. Calling Bandersnatch and Edith Finch and Gone Home a game, which has very specific connotations to me is like calling the back of your cereal box a book because there's words on it that you can read okay interacting with a story doesn't make it a video game it needs very specific elements that it needs to have that these narratives don't have what are those elements there's really only one mm -hmm. and then variations on it and shades of it. it needs to have a failure state not to be a video game specifically but to be a game it has to be a contest of some time. Something versus something. Player versus board. Player versus player. Like, a sport is a contest. One of the teams has to lose. Doom is a game because the, the monsters can kill you and then you die. Mm -hmm. Even Mist, you can get stuck and not be able to continue until you figure out what it is you're missing. You can't lose Bandersnatch. There's no contests. There's no failure state. You can die, but you get to restart like Mario does. But it's very different the way it's written, isn't it? Because in Bandersnatch, when you quote-unquote die, it's not like Netflix shuts down. You're, you don't have mm -hmm. to go back to the beginning of the story. And when you do quote-unquote fail, it's not because you did something wrong. It's because you picked a path in a story that was presented to you as this story has many paths. In Mario, when you die, the screen cuts to black. You watch the Bowser face eat the whole screen or whatever. Your little death marker counts down by one and you're shoved out of whatever level you're in. And now you have to replay the level from some point. You lose that state. Is Braid a video game or a narrative? It's a, well, There's a failure state in Braid because, again, you can get stuck. You can get to a level and not be able to progress because you don't know how to progress. You can never die in Braid because you can always rewind. But there are definitely places where you can reach and then I can't get past this point. I don't know how to progress. So you can get into that failure state of not knowing what to do. That's never going to happen in What Remains of Edith Finch. A couple years ago when What Remains of Edith Finch was new and I just played it, I was going to make a YouTube video explaining my thoughts on all this. Because I think it's actually damaging to these kinds of things in the long term to lump them in with video games which are very different. And I think you see this whenever there's backlash against, especially Gone Home, had tons of backlash when it came out. Oh, it's not a game. It's another non-game for the SJWs. Like, there was all of that there. Yeah. I'm, there are still some jerks who are going to be jerks. But if the Gone Home people had said, this is a new kind of story that we're telling in a new kind of way, that's similar in aspects to a movie and similar in aspects to a video game, but isn't really either. It's a new thing. That takes away a lot of the ammunition from people who go on Steam and try this right now. Go on to the Steam page for Edith Finch and look oh, at... Oh, I, I saw all that crap back when Gone Home was new. I know all about the it's not really a game nonsense. But here's the thing. There's been interactive novel games, you know, whatever you want to call them, on consoles since video games have existed. Mm -hmm. It's not new. 
I guess if you call it a walking simulator, like the fidelity of it is new, but there's been things like this as long as there's been video games. And I'm not even talking about adventure games. I mean, like straight up, you just walk through a narrative on a disc, you know? There have been. I'm actually having a lot of difficulty thinking of one off the top of my head. Well, they were huge in Japan, for one thing. Like visual uh, novel kind of stuff? Is that what you Visual mean? novels were huge in Japan mm-hmm. back in the day. Yeah, and and granted, I started off this whole conversation saying how much I enjoyed quote-unquote walking simulators more than the kind of visual novels that my wife is playing. They do feel like they're closely related. I think one mostly just has better fidelity than the other, but there is a lot different about the style because one, you're picking choices and then you read for a long ass time and the other one, you're walking around and making little choices. Uh, In Edith Finch, I don't even think you make choices. There's no decision points. At any point in the time you're in the house and there's one thing to do, your only choice is go do that thing or don't do that thing and just stand there. Uh, Yeah, I think it's a problem of branding. I think if there had been a better term than walking simulator. I hate that term so much (laughs) right because it's super derisive it's the term i hate more than metroidvania now i don't have a problem with metroidvania i think it's okay (laughs) yeah i didn't used to like it because it bothered me because i was like you just took two games that are in this style and decided that's what it's called and most games of that genre are not really like metroid or castlevania (laughs) no they're not (laughs) when it comes down to it the thing is game is just such a good shorthand like when i say oh yeah i'm playing this game called edith finch like People immediately know I sit with a controller and I play a thing. Any other thing, interactive fiction or interactive narrative, they're all... It needs like a four-letter acronym. It needs to be like, I don't know. I'll I'll think of one. Video, game... No, that doesn't work. Uh, I think the reason they get called games is because they are usually put on traditional gaming consoles. They come out on consoles or Steam or whatever, yeah. When we got Wii Fit, Wii Fit is an exercise program, but we called it a game. Hell, they used to put um, things to do your taxes and stuff on these things and i'm sure people still called them a game (laughs) because there's something that always comes up every time i have this debate people always like well you interact with it and interaction makes it a game and i'm like if that's true then my most played game this year has been google spreadsheets (laughs) by far (laughs) by a hundred hours easily i think the key ingredient is for entertainment You interact with it for entertainment. McLean, I think you underestimate how often I use Google Spreadsheets for entertainment. (laughs) I mean, that's... (laughs) But but seriously, by that definition, like any website would be a game. And there definitely are websites that are like games, but other ones are just, I'm going to read this time travel thing all night. So let's come let's come away from video games for a second then cuz uh, the definition like you're interacting with something for entertainment makes it a game. Cuz when I was a kid we had a game called Upwards. Are you familiar with Upwards? Vaguely. It's like Scrabble. You have little plastic tiles with letters and you can play letters on top of other letters and make different words. It's the stackable we, Scrabble, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We had an Upwards set at home and we did you pl- use it to play the game Upwards, but at the time, I was also really into writing, like, RPG scripts, because I was playing Final Fantasy II for the first time, and I would, like, make my little characters. And the upwards board is this plastic, like, 10 by 10 tile grid, and I would use the little upwards tiles to make a map, and I would use the letters to represent characters, and I would act out the little scenes. Mm-hmm. This is an adorable childhood story, but I wasn't playing upwards. I was using the board to do another entertaining activity that wasn't a game. I was just using my imagination. Okay. I think that's it's the same thing as me setting up a spreadsheet that I'm just cataloging all the spells from the Final Fantasy series into their various colors or whatever other nonsense I get up to. My god, I'm 36 and I'm still doing this kind of crap. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, I think, honestly, when it comes down to it, it's mostly just a convenient shorthand. I'm on Steam, I'm playing a thing, I'm calling it a game. When I talk about it, I do explain it. I say it's a narrative fiction, it's a walking simulator, it's a whatever word is going to explain this to you. It's a much more emotionally charged subject than I ever thought. Because I think most people are not, they're more like you. It's it's just a thing that I call it, it doesn't matter to me that much. I mentioned that I was going to do a video on the subject... And I took the script for the video because I wanted to run it by a couple people. I ran it by three different people a couple of years ago. And all three of them got upset with me because I disagreed with them on the subject. And it became very clear that to these people, it's very important that these things are called games. It's not just a convenient shorthand. Like, they need to be called games. I think part of the reason they need to be called games is 
in a lot of ways a backlash to the internet grognargs who are like, eh, SJW is trying to put gays in my video games. People use It's Not a Game as a reason to dismiss it entirely. Yes. So I think you have a backlash to the backlash. People are like, these are games. And they and that is the hill they want to die on. That, that's definitely my experience. So I think that it's not worth arguing that they're not games because the people making them very much think of themselves as video game developers. They have that mentality. And for a lot of them, this is the short thing I'm going to make that is going to lead to making, you know, other things in a lot of ways. I, I hope that's not their mentality. I want the Edith Finch people to just keep making stuff like Edith Finch. I don't want them to graduate to making real video games or whatever. That came out wrong. But I do think that the people <laughs> the people who make them feel like they're making video games. If that makes right. sense. They come from video gaming schools. They just, they're just they using the genre differently. The same way that Bandersnatch is using the genre of film differently. And Homestuck used the genre of web comics and flash animation differently. I think that people who are doing this are coming from a perspective of, I played video games... And these are the these are the stories I want to tell through what I consider video games. And I think when you say that's not a video game, they get understandably defensive the same way that if, if you told the people who made Bandersnatch, well, that's just a game. <laughs> they would be like, no, we made a we made an interactive film. No, I, d I definitely see why people would get their hackles up. And that's the reason I decided to not put together that video. Yeah, like, I scrapped it. I do still think this is an important distinction for two like major reasons. One is that if you go to the tag cloud for Edith Finch and look at it, it has stuff like Story Rich, Walking Simulator, Female Protagonist, and all that. There's nothing on the store page that says this isn't a video game. When you buy this, you're not getting a puzzle game or an adventure game. It, you're not getting what it looks like Steam usually sells. And a good friend of ours is one of the people I ran my script by, and he says, well, you know, there's a big problem right now, that people are buying stuff like that playing it inside of Steam's two-hour grace period, and then immediately returning it. Oh, yeah. At the time, I thought, oh, God, that's terrible. That's awful that people are doing that. But I thought about it afterwards, and I'm like, how many people downloaded Edith Finch because they read some impassioned article about how it's the best game ever, and yes, it deserves to be a game, and it calls itself a game, and it's got all the same Steam tag in the cloud as Myst and other games... And then played it for two hours and there was no gameplay. And then looked at their watch and said, you know what? I think that's a problem. Because if these things are sold in the same realm as video games, we're kind of holding them to the same standard as video games. Like you said, you'd spend 20 bucks on a Blu-ray, that's true, but you wouldn't spend 20 bucks on a two hour long video game. Did you ever play a game on the DS called Hotel Dusk? I did not. It's a kind of visual novel. I was actually surprised at how engrossed I got in the game's narrative. Like, I really liked the characters and the writing. The worst part about that game, by far, is the stupid gameplay it insists on having. The stupid hunt the pixel, do the dumb little DS, blow in the microphone trick, oh, put together yeah. this jigsaw puzzle. Somebody said it needs to be more of a game. It needs to be more of a game. And I fear that if we continue on this trajectory of having this war between it's not a game versus yes, it is a game. Edith Finch is going to look at their, what the money they made. Well, all these people bought it and returned it. Our next project, we have this beautiful narrative story that we want to follow up with. We have to put some token gameplay in it. There has to be token gameplay or else people are going to rip us again. Yeah. And I really would hate to see that happen. Going all the way back to, you know, novels and stuff, like genre has always been a point of contention for a lot of people. And I think the struggle is what the agreed upon term is for the narrow. And I'm really scared Walking Sim is going to stick. <laughs> I might be wrong about this, but I think Walking Simulator as a term was coined by Yahtzee in a very sarcastic way. Because he's one of these people, whenever he plays a game with no gameplay, he's hard on it. Even if he enjoys on it, because this was presented to me as a game. I'm a game reviewer, and there was no gameplay. Right. So, I've got to tell you, it's not a game, it's a walking simulator. And then the Gamergate crowd picked up on it, and then the, like the Edith Finch crowd kind of appropriated the term. And I just, you don't even walk that much in Edith Finch. It's like a swinging owl 
kite simulator. <laughs> and that's really what it is, is a lot of the blowback came about the same time because this is a, a lot of these stories are, are being used to tell different kinds of stories. They're being used to tell queer stories or feminist stories in interesting new ways. And a lot of them are done independently. They're done with lower budgets because people don't want to pay money for that stuff. It's being used to tell different kinds of stories and people who only like to shoot people in the head and scream obscenities at them are upset that the SJWs are taking the video games away. I really want someone to develop like a game with the depth and complexity of Edith Finch, like just this, this, this is the narrative and the interaction about a typical like Call of Duty guy who all you do is run around killing people, but you don't actually control the gun. It's just, it happens on screen. Because <gasps> I'll bet it's flipped. I'll bet the Gamergate crowd who ins- will insist it's a game, and then the other crowd will, will insist that it's not because there's no gameplay and you don't get to actually shoot anybody. Well, it's like the people who are like, keep politics out of my fiction, and then they scream about like how the SJWs ruined Star Wars, and I'm like, bro, war is in the title of the thing you are lionizing. It's <laughs> political, for God's sakes. You're so stupid. <laughs> That's the takeaway from this, McLean, is everybody but us is stupid. Everybody is stupid besides us. Small digression. On January 11th, 2019, Choose Co. initiated a trademark infringement legal challenge against Netflix for the film Black Mirror Bandersnatch. I hate Choose Co. And now the entire goal of my life is to destroy their company. (laughs) Are you with me, McLean? Can we get this done? I I just want to see if they lose this. If they they lose this, I'm fine. Because they totally should. Can I ask you a uh, a favor? Sure. For my birthday this year, this is what I want. I want you to call me on the phone and sing me happy birthday in your voice for Colin, the programmer man from Bandersnatch. (laughs) That's what I would like for my birthday this year. You know what? I think I can try to make that happen. (laughs) Happy birthday. (laughs) 